So, how you doing? We're gonna react to some videos. Yeah. Uh, just gotta grab my headphones. Oop, dang. You got my headphones? I'm gonna plug these bad boys in. Oh, wait, can I? Well, let me just, I'm gonna grab something real quick. Okay, we're gonna be reacting to some scary videos. Or not, like, not, it's not, like, scary. Or scary stories. So it is scary. Good evening, all. And welcome. Oh. Getting behind the wheel and going for a drive to somewhere new is a very fun thing to do. But it can lead to some rather dark and unpleasant situations, which you're about to find out. If you're new to the channel or have just found it, don't forget to subscribe for new content every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. And be sure to check out our app with over two and a half thousand extra stories for you to listen to. But for now, it's time to get comfortable. Hit the like button and let the darkness take control. No, that was like... When I was about 17, me and a few of my friends used to drive out to Union Cemetery in no. eastern Connecticut to do some late night ghost dog hunting. Screen? We'd walk around and take... Okay, I put on a new one. It was just a black screen for like an hour. I've lived a long enough life to have heard and seen a lot of unusual things. Of course, having spent many of my years in it, in the state of Florida, I've seen firsthand on several occasions why the infamous Florida man is always making headlines across the country. Heck, I could have been one of those Florida men back in the day. But I can tell you without a doubt that no matter how steeled you think you've become against the surprises life throws at you, you're never invincible. Life always I'm holds the power to shock you to your core. I mean, take me I, for example. I spent my years in the military. I bought the wrong thing. Don't you always feel like you're invincible sometimes? Or like you get hurt really bad, but like... I don't know, I always just feel like I'm invincible for some reason. How long is this? Is this an hour? Drifting between one rock and another hard place, but no matter what messed up stuff I have to see go down or deal with, I always bounce back. Well, almost always. Out of everything I've seen, only one thing made me lose my cool, and I think it was just the sheer unexpectedness of it. Just that I didn't think anything like it could ever happen in broad daylight in the middle of the city, but there's no denying that this happened. Everyone knows about it these days. It was a nice sunny day in Miami. I was making my way across town down the concrete mess of a highway just to get out of that part of town I'd been in for the last few weeks. I'd never owned a car, so I was taking my bike down the shoulder, except I wasn't riding it. I hadn't been sleeping well, and the Why night before I didn't bike? manage to catch any sleep at all. I was honestly too drowsy to pedal in a straight line. So I was literally just walking my bike down the shoulder of the road. There was a sidewalk next to me, but it was on the other side of a concrete barrier, like the ones they used to divide directions of traffic on freeways. I could have hopped it on foot, but not with my bike. I don't know exactly how I'd ended up sandwiched there between the cars and the concrete, but after what happened later, I'd take that way again for the alternative. The sun was getting high and bright, it was starting to hurt my eyes. I squinted ahead and saw that there was a bridge down the way, a nice wide overpass to provide some shade. I started to quicken my pace, which felt pretty silly given that there were countless cars flying past me. But between the deafening whoosh of each vehicle passing, I kept thinking I was hearing something. 
something that sounded like the shouts of a heated argument between drunk people. That's the problem with you. It's no one else down. That might not be something you'd expect to hear in the middle of the day in your town, but in Miami, it's more than common. But I couldn't help but think it sounded a little unusual. I figured that sleep deprivation was screwing with me, and pressed on. But as I got closer to the bridge, the shouting grew louder. It sounded more like screaming, but there was some other tone in there, like a growling, rabid dog. Every time I thought I was about to decipher it, a car would blow past me. Then, the sound would change. By the time I got to the bridge, my curiosity was piqued. I could definitely tell where the noise was coming from, straight ahead of me, just a few more yards under the shade. I peeked over the edge of the barrier onto the sidewalk and saw two hairy pairs of men's legs sliding around together on the sidewalk. I instinctively darted my eyes away, not wanting to see much more above the thigh level. It's experimenting people need to get a room. What are they thinking? Doing stuff like that on the side of the road in the beaming sun. Well, obviously no one cares because no one's stopping. Just another day in Florida. I did my best to keep my eyes to myself as I passed under the shade. I was thankful for... Okay, I kind of forgot. That... But beneath the underside of the road above, some strange sounds began to echo, forcing me in for another... This wasn't an act of exhibition. But there were two messed up looking dudes lying naked on the concrete, and one of them was crouched over the other, tearing into a man's face with his teeth. There was blood gushing out and spilling onto the asphalt, bone showing through the bite wounds on the face, and flesh in the attacker's teeth as he looked up to notice me, just to scream like a feral zombie as he looked me dead in the eye. It was at that exact moment that I jumped onto my bike and pedaled off at top speed. All prior drowsiness was erased by the shot of adrenaline. I kept looking back to see if I was being ran down by that psycho. But luckily, he'd been content with scaring me off. I rolled down the first ramp that I got to and immediately went looking for a cop. I found one not even a block away, surrounded by several other very concerned looking citizens. The police officer, however, seemed annoyed, but I was in a panic, and I never panic, so I must have been a sight to see all on my own. I barged through all those people and got right up into the cop's face. There's a flippin' zombie on the frickin' pedestrian path, up the ramp, just up that way. Come on, don't get hysterical with me, people. What do you mean by zombie? There's a dude eating another dude's face off, man! Finally. It seemed like something clicked in the cop's brain. He didn't say anything to us. He walked straight into his car, speaking something into his radio. Then he drove up the off-ramp going the wrong way, out of sight. Me and those other civilians traded a few strange looks, all in an understandable loss for words. Some of them looked like avid bicyclists. Others just looked like people who'd come out of their cars. I wondered how long that thing had been going on with all those people just driving past like that. Then we heard the gunshots, five of them in quick succession. Everybody on the street stopped what they were doing, dumbfounded. In just a few minutes, more and more cops came, followed by an ambulance, and then the army of press. News van after news van drove up to broadcast the scoop, live on the scene or whatever. I've heard a, I heard a story about this, like a zombie apo like a zombie thing. Like I heard about this, like this man started eating a dude's face, and then um, he wasn't on any like drugs or anything. Like it was like a freaking zombie. I've, I heard about this. It was. I heard some office building captured the whole thing on their security cameras. It was the talk of the town for weeks. I'm sure the name Miami was heard all across the world alongside zombie attack, cannibal eats face off homeless man, Florida man gets wasted and eats face. I don't care for any of that. People who weren't there seem fascinated by it, but I know more than anything that I never want to see pictures of that horrible tragedy. Just from seeing it one time, I was shaken up for months. 
I still get hair standing up on the back of my neck whenever I pass under a bridge. A person who was riding his bike here off the MacArthur Causeway yesterday afternoon says he saw one man eating another man alive. You're about to hear from the Miami man who had his face chewed off. Uh, my face is all pepper My eyes got plucked, plucked out. And ignored the officer's orders to stop eating the other man's face. <laughs> And his eyes went red, and I kind of just stood in shock. It was like, is it scary, or was I... Was it not scary? Out of every day that I have ever lived through, even with so many of them being so hard, there is one that stands out as the worst day of my entire life. It was my mother's 63rd birthday. The morning started just like any other. I helped my little girl get dressed and ready for school. It was supposed to be a big day for her. She had been practicing for her school spelling bee for weeks, and today was the day. The two of us were about to walk out the door when my husband grabbed me on the shoulder and stopped us before the door. You can't let her go to school looking like that. She looks unkempt. What will people think when she's on stage? I was going to just accept that he was right and change our daughter into some different clothes. But my mother, who was living with us at the time, had a bit of a grudge against my husband, and she wouldn't have it. It was her birthday after all. Who do you think you're talking to? If you make my granddaughter late for school on the day of her recital, you got another thing coming. Go, baby, get out of here. Don't let that oaf tell you what to do. My husband looked a little dumbstruck by my mother's resistance to his remark. He was usually the head of the household, and he would always get his way. But ever since my mother retired and started living with us, she had fought him for control over every little thing. I didn't want to be caught in the crossfire between the two of them on that day, so I just left like my mother told me to. I dropped my daughter off at school, then spent several hours running errands. Early in the afternoon, I got a call from my mother. For some reason, she was elated. Huh. Today sure is a good day, dear. How's about you take your old lady out for some coffee and pastries for her birthday? There wasn't really any way that I could say no. I might have married a controlling man, but I was born to an even more demanding and particular mother. So I put a hold on the grocery shopping I was about to do and met her at her favorite cafe in town. Which was, of course, ridiculously overpriced and overrated. She ordered the most expensive things on the menu on my tab, then told me to take pictures of her holding them up to commemorate the occasion. When I asked for a bite, she said, Oh, give it a rest, honey. I've done enough for you today. I deserve this to myself. I was confused by what she meant, but I didn't bother to ask. I heard my phone go off from my purse, and I welcomed the distraction. I'd gotten a text from my sister-in-law, asking where my mother was. I replied that she was at the coffee house with me, but I didn't get a reply. Instead, about 15 minutes later, the police pulled up. They marched inside with forlorn faces, and told us to follow them to the police station, but they wouldn't tell us why. Now, I understand that they didn't want to make a scene at the place of business. When we got to the station, we were met by a man in a suit who spoke to us softly. Hello, ma'ams. I have some very unfortunate news. If you would, I'd like to talk to one of you at a time in this room here. The other can sit in the waiting room with your family. Oh, let me go first. It's my birthday. Um, sure. Come with me, ma'am. And so, my mother disappeared into a windowless room with that man, as I was ushered into a larger okay. waiting room, where I found my entire family of in-laws sitting in quiet, sobbing despair. I asked them, Do any of you know what's going on? But none of them answered. They just looked at me with daggers in their tearful eyes. Confused, I found a seat away from them, up against the wall that was shared with the room my mother had just been taken into. 
I was soon to find out that that room was purposed for interrogations and had an extremely thin wall. Something terrible happened today, ma'am. Your son-in-law has passed away. Huh? What'd you say? Your daughter's husband has been killed. Keep on pausing the one thing. Her laugh. Like, what is that laugh? I don't even know. <laughs> oh, 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 oh no! In that moment, my world collapsed. I'd just seen my husband alive a few hours ago, but now he was gone. I couldn't think of a single person who would want to hurt him, but then it hit me. The last person I'd left him alone with was my own mother. So he's dead? Yes, he was killed. He was shot a dozen times in his own home. Yay! Happy birthday to me. I did it, I did it. Everything after that is just a blur. They called my daughter out of school and made us go in the room with my mother. I remember her saying something like, Aren't you so happy, baby? You're free now. No more of that jerk hanging around. But there was nothing I could say. I'm still struggling to recover from that day. Almost ten years ago. I just can't believe how deranged she became. That she would do something so despicable and then celebrate it. She even made me take her out to lunch afterwards. I know I didn't marry a perfect man, but she had no right to do what she did. We could have worked things out, but now, none of that is possible. But over everything else, it's my daughter I pray for. For her grandmother to take away her father like that, and act like she was doing her a favor. I, I just don't understand what snapped in that woman's mind. What did you think of him? Why do you say that? That's the big thumbs down. You didn't like him. I want to tell you that just within the last 30 minutes, the judge did rule that there is now enough evidence for Cynthia Sidabaka to stand trial for murder. Did he do it? Can you tell me? He's got to be dead. Is he dead? He's dead. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Good, 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 good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Did you check to see if he was doing it? Thank you. Uh. <laughs> this is me one day into playing Call of Duty Mobile. This is me three days into playing Call of Duty Mobile. This Folding and hanging up clothes, there wasn't much else to do. That's why I picked up the habit of hiding my AirPods behind my hair and listening to music to get through the boredom of my shifts. I was fully aware that this was against company policy, but I didn't really care. I would have quit from the lack of stimulation alone if it weren't for my music. And it wasn't like my supervisor was around much anyway. I don't think they ever would have known if it weren't for the major incident which got me fired. The day started like any other. I finished the task left over from the previous shift and got settled into my usual spot by the fitting rooms, folding the same 10 articles of clothing over and over again while tucked into a corner in which I'd only be seen by customers who were already in the fitting room aisle. It took almost an hour before I got my first customer. Hello, sir. I'd like to try on these clothes, please. He had about five or six articles of clothing, so I handed him a tag numbered six and pointed him down the aisle as I gave him my usual customer service voice. All the rooms are available. Hang this outside your door to let others know your room is occupied. Well, thank you very much. After waiting a few seconds for a response he didn't get, he gave up and took the first door on the left. Even on slow days, the business came in waves, so it wasn't more than a minute later before the next customer approached me. At a glance, I could tell there was something a little off about the guy. He didn't seem like the type of person that would usually buy clothes, like at all, but it didn't matter to me. I treat all customers with the same level of hospitality, none. Can I get in one of 
those rooms? The guy had far more than 10 articles of clothing, which is the limit per customer, but there was no way I was going to argue with him over it. So I just handed him a tag number 10 and sent him on his way away from me. All the rooms except the first one on the left are available. Hang this outside your door to let others know your room is occupied. He took the tag slowly, like he wasn't sure if it was some kind of trap or not. Then, he went into the second room on the left. I knew that was weird because most people would put a little more space between themselves and the people changing next to them. The fitting rooms were more like stalls. The walls don't go all the way down to the floor and they don't reach the ceiling. But there was nothing I was willing to do about it. That alone was not a good enough reason to interrupt somebody while they were changing. So I just went back to folding, waiting for them to come out and give me more clothes to fold. A few minutes in, my favorite song came on shuffle. I discreetly turned the volume up a few notches, just to jam out a little bit for the one song. Then I turned it back down so I could hear new customers approaching. That's when the weird guy came out. I thought it was strange how he came out before the other guy, considering he had so much more clothes. He had all the clothes jumbled up into one tangled mess which he plopped down on the cart in front of me. Thank you, have a blessed day. He sounded out of breath like he'd just done a fitting room speed run. He gave me a good look at the bloodshot white of his eyes, then tore his gaze away and walked off in a rush. I shrugged. Oh well, just another day of dealing with Walmart shoppers. But as I was folding up the clothes he'd just dropped off, I noticed something I'd never seen before, not even at Walmart. There were bloodstains smeared all over the clothes, little ones at first, just an eye-catching dab or two. Then more and more towards the bottom, until the last shirt was nearly soaked in red. I began to panic, pausing my music to hear my quickened breath. I put aside the clothes and walked down the aisle. The number six tag was still hanging on the first door, and beneath it, a thick pool of blood seeping out into the aisle. I pushed open the door, revealing the source. The nice man from before was stuffed into the corner with his face torn to shreds, skin hanging off the bone, his half-naked body full of deep holes still spilling out with blood. The blood was everywhere. And on the mirror, a message had been written in it by hand. The writer's fingerprints visible in the coagulation. The parting words of the killer read, The devil made me do it. Needless to say, I got fired that day, but I don't care. I don't even care that they caught the guy the same day. All I can think about when I remember that day is, how could I have let it happen? If I'd just been doing my job, if I'd only been paying just one little bit of attention, I could have heard that man being murdered. Maybe then, I could have done something to stop it. Maybe I could have intervened, or screamed, or something. I could have done anything to save that man's life, but no, I wasn't doing any of those things. I was lost in my own little world within my airpods, and that man is dead because of me. Worse, he's more than dead. Ah! That's gonna be it for this video, guys. Oh. <clears throat> Gosh dang it. Hope you liked it. Um, I'm gonna try to do one tomorrow. I'm gonna try to do a VR one tomorrow. Um, if the VR one doesn't happen, then I'm gonna try to do a, uh, just, I'm gonna try to do something with my friend Jackson, if you might remember him. But, I hope you like this video, and see you guys in the next video. Bye.